Good morning, everyone. My name's Paul. I'm a Bird Park Ranger for White Hawk Hill and the wider East Brighton area. Like John before me, I'm going to actually have, for the first time ever, a sheet in front of me to read from because I normally wing it and I have a tendency to waffle, digress, and tangent somewhat, so I'm thinking Dom of your achy arm. Um, oh, there we go. I feel more relaxed already. <laughs> uh, I've been working as a ranger on Whitehall Hill for about a decade now. It's rather a magical place for many reasons, but particularly for its, its archaeology, its ecology, and more recently its increased sense of community, much of which off the back of the project that we're talking about today. Seeing as you're all here on the hill, I thought I'd provide you with a, a, a snippet of the wider nature reserve, how we got to where we are, and where I see things going as people, wildlife, landscape, and history are all things I find more accessible when together, working together. Um, and I know that there's been talk already in this conference about um, local history, ancient history, uh, natural history, and community coming together being um, instrumental in how things succeed, and as you were saying, John, about funding and, and uh, moving forward. Um, this is the hill in flower in sort of mid-August, and, uh, and then in, in to the north of that you've got the uh, White Hawk Estate, which is actually one of the most uh, socio-economically deprived housing estates in the south of England still now. John mentioned in the 90s, 80s, 70s, 80s, 90s, it was a terrible time for the estate, and it has gone through many different sort of stages uh, culturally. But at the moment, we're, I think we're on a bit of a high, certainly, um, not just geographically. Um, so, but with regards to the ecology of the hill, ecologically, the hill contains some of the city's largest, scarcest and most diverse, biodiverse grasslands. The South Downs on our, on our doorstep contains the lion's share of Britain's internationally rare and ancient chalk grassland. It's one of the world's richest habitats, believe it or not. Um, a rainforest in miniature, and some cheeky souls have dared to even call it living archaeology. Am I stepping on toes here? Have I gone too far? <laughs> um, the thin, nutrient-poor topsoils sitting on the Cretaceous bedrock chalk uh, create hugely competitive plant and invertebrate communities because it's hard living in that kind of environment, all fighting for space in this difficult place. Uh, up to 45 different plant species can be found in a square metre of grassland, which is pretty unparalleled. Um, uh, many of which are chalk specialists and therefore precious, especially when we consider that up to 97% of the UK's flowerage grassland uh, has disappeared in the last century in the UK. If we also take into account all the butterflies, bees, moths, spiders, crickets, beetles, other creepy crawlers and fungus that have developed and flourished alongside these largely man-made grassland habitats, we're talking about a hefty chunk of biomass, which is good for me. Um, <coughs> This is the Adonis Blue. I could have chosen a better photo. It looks pretty normal there, doesn't it? Average. A local historian, I think you mentioned John um, Day Fangs, uh, the local historian and, and natural historian, uh, described this species as a, a piece of the prime summer sun sky chinking off and landing down on the ground, which is, I thought was a nice way of, because when you see it in real life, it doesn't really represent the true beauty of the, of the, of the insect. And it's only a 28 mils wide, it's a tiny little thing, but when you see them in numbers, it's quite a sight, and they really do stand out against all the other blues, um, as well as all the other different, there's 37 species of butterfly on the White Hawk Hill, just outside the race course here, which is, apart from Ludington Heath, uh, north of the Weald, it's, that's, that's the highest in Sussex, and probably therefore, because of our climate here, um, in the country. Sorry, that's my golden-cheeked gibbon ringtone, ringtone there. <laughs> <laughs> they are rare in these parts. <laughs> I won't be talking about that species today. <laughs> but, but please just listen to its dulcet tones. Um, it will turn off in a second. Uh, <laughs> uh, so that's, that's the Adonis Blue. And again, this is a chalk grass and specialist. So it's, it's food plant, which is the, the, the plant that it's, uh, the female lays her eggs on. Um, is, she only does that with one plant, uh, which is called horseshoe vet, which is only found on steep south-facing chalk grassland slopes like the one we have on White Hawk Hill, just to the east of us here. Uh, but it also animates around the site as well. The, the species will spread a little bit. Um, and also here you have, to give a, a representative from the floral community, this is round-headed rampion. I thought this would be quite prudent to use at the moment because we recently had the uh, installation of the, round, of the rampion wind farm 
off the Brighton coast, which you can clearly see today if it doesn't, it hadn't missed it over. Um, and they, uh, the inspiration for the name of the Rampion Wind Farm was the Round-Headed Rampion, which is also known as the Pride of Sussex. So it's not actually, from, from my perspective, it's not a particularly useful plant. It's not a great pollinator plant, it's not a great uh, food plant for larva or for larva, but it is um, pretty, pretty uh, restricted to the South Downs, and there's loads of it on the causeway enclosure. Unfortunately, it comes into flower in July and August, so we won't be seeing it today. But if I see you later on, we can maybe show you some leaves, some, ba some basal leaves. <laughs> um, but back in 2009, I started out here and I felt largely on my own. Uh, clearing paths, bashing scrub, monitoring species and engaging with local schools and community hubs. So that's the Whitehall Primary School, just at the base of the hill to the east of us. Um, and I'm doing a, a talk about in the reintroduction of sheep. Um, more and more people start turning out for guided walks and practical work days and public events such as the, the brilliant 2009 Stone Age Day, as we've mentioned. I've given it a slightly different name. Uh, which beautifully showcased and consolidated the hill's features and the people that use it and hold it dear. Uh, as well as local people that had no idea of what was on their doorstep, as has been said this morning already. Um, Looking around at all the activities on that day, flint napping, artifact displays, guided walks, a trial dig site, an eco hub, bushcraft, petting lambs, was hugely inspiring for me. And UCL's Dr. Matt Pope is world famous. Uh, <laughs> um, his world famous deer skinning display was icing on the cake with a front row audience of bloodthirsty 10 year olds, mouth agape in both horror and awe struck delight. <laughs> Uh, then I brought, I'll never forget their faces, it's brilliant. Yeah. Then I brought back the sheep, back onto the wildlife rich steep slope to the east of us here uh, in, in 2009, uh, outside the scheduled area, but to help restore the old chalk grassland by bringing back the animals that helped create the landscape in the first place. Scores of volunteer shepherds, or lookers as we've called them, patrolled the hill and we received loads of international media attention from our groundbreaking urban grazing project, including a bumper length piece on Country File. There's the lovely Matt. He's actually a generally nice bloke as well. A uh, hugely successful public consultation about the Hill's future management boosted the momentum further in 2012. Um, we had, I think I, I put out a thousand copies and we had 450 responses, which is, for the council, was unprecedented. So it really shows the tide is starting to, 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 to move in, in, uh, in our favour. Um, and then when the Heritage Lottery funded Dig Whitehawk project came, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, want, I want this to bear, I'll wear it everywhere. Uh, came along in 2014, the timing could not have been better for me, and I felt like I certainly wasn't on my own anymore. My role in the project in 2014 consisted of organizing and carrying out improvement works within the monument, and the key actions were, Uh, to remove old and tatty and dangerous fencing on the monument, replaced with new livestock fencing. To remove an 80 metre illegally placed late 20th century earth bank that John, I think you mentioned, um, on the north side of Manor Hill, but within the monument, to enable better interpretation of the authentic mounds and ditches. Because things like that do muddy the waters a little bit with regards to how you interpret the site. Um, uh, to install additional security bollards on Manor Hill to better protect the site from unauthorised vehicle incursion. As you guys have said, we, there was a, a long line already placed, but there were a few gaps where they were still getting in here and there. Uh, so we consolidated those. Uh, and to tidy up the site of rubbish and other surface debris, of which, that, which was significant, more than we thought. Um, I worked alongside the Dig Whitehawk team from Archaeology Southeast, UCL, Brighton Hove City Council Museum, Brighton Hove Archaeological Society and various volunteer groups with interest in both ecology and archaeology over three weeks of work on site. And I think it's important to stress that those two interests of archaeology and ecology mixed over those weeks, which was really, really interesting and, and, and lovely to see. Um, uh, post, where are we? We picked up over 100 sacks of rubbish and several truckloads of old fencing and fly tip along the way and some needles, John. Uh, Post-excavation, we managed to replant the vanquished earth bank with, um, and some of the larger sites, dig sites, with several thousand downland wildflower plants grown from seed 
collected from Whitehall Hill itself, so good genetic stock of plants going back onto the hill, many of which are actually rare in the UK and, and, and in the world. Um, I attended the Dick Whitehawk Community Open Day in August with a handful of petting lambs and some lookerers. I led two well-attended natural history walks through the flower-rich grassland on that day of the monument itself. Highlights included 12 butterfly species, although it's kind of windy and overcast, wasn't it? With some nice, nice sunny patches. Uh, purple slash splashes of round-headed rampion, as I've mentioned, and autumn gentian, a nice rare downland plant, coming into flower amongst the pinks, whites and yellows of late summer downland as well as a delightfully timed cameo appearance by one of Britain's rarest butterflies, Dryas flavisons. doesn't even have a common name. Um, it's a holy grail species amongst UK coleopterists, or beetle geeks, as they like to be called. Um, I've actually found three of them now, the female as well, which is the really, really one that's very difficult to find, um, on the site, uh, in the same place, actually just by the centre of the monument. Looking back, I feel fortunate to have met and worked with so many new and interesting people, and continuing to build on these partnerships with a shared interest will be key to the Hill's future. I'd like to thank project leaders John, Hillary and co for fascinating adventure, Richard and Carl Brighton Racecourse, who still works here, Richard's here, uh, for their support, and her division has gone now, isn't she? Uh, and Enthusiasm, and all the other organisations, volunteers and local people that helped to make the project a true success. Personally, I thought the Dig Whitehall project was brilliantly planned and executed, from my perspective, my diary is perpetually chock-a-block, so it's div it's, um, that's kind of my, my biggest limiting factor as, as a ranger, is that we have a massive remit of work, so it's really important for me to be able to, be, to, be, to engage in projects, to have some notice, to, and for things to be well-planned, unlike me. <laughs> um, I, was pre I was present for most of the planning meetings and was always given plenty of notice, which is so important in my capacity as the site manager. Um, here we go. Urban grazing. In 2015, riding on what seemed like a tidal wave of support, I was finally able to reintroduce sheep to the monument after almost a century's absence. This can present many challenges in such a busy urban area, teeming with dog walkers and teenage scallywags, as well as a busy bridle path running through the site and obvious infrastructural restrictions such as fencing due to the monument's protected status. But by this point, there was no stopping us. Munching veg on monument. That was actually a, a, a headline for the next photo that wasn't really for you. Here we go. Munching veg on the monument. <laughs> Archaeologically speaking, sheep are considered a preferred management tool here as they nibble the vegetation sensitively and randomly. Rather than big mowers coming in, blitzing the site and everything living in the site, and gradually damaging and eroding the monument by scalping the banks and ditches. So sheep are a really, really advantageous addition for me and, and for you guys as well, from your perspective. I thought well, I hope so. Um, the other great thing about sheep, look at that, is that they, when they finish munching, they reveal the monument's topography rather magnificently, I feel. I remember when I first took that photo, I was ravenously emailing you both, look at this! Doesn't that look great? I mean, it, it's been a while since we've been able to see the banks and ditches so clearly without having loads of mower lines and, some, and scalp marks and everything on the top. And that's just after two and a half, three weeks of sheep grazing the monument that's directly south of us on the west side of the pull-up area, which I'm sure some of you will see later. Um, the people you can see here helping me move the sheep across the race course to the east side of the monument are all residents of the villainous terrace of houses known as Monument View. We can't blame them. Um, that you can see beyond. Local residents can be rather negative protagonists in times of change on nearby green space land, I found in 10 years of doing this. But I have to say that the biggest slating I ever get these days is when I move the sheep on to other sites. And they love their flock and are now part of their local landscape again. My work here is done. That's how I feel about it when that sort of thing happens. When they go, what have you done with my sheep? They've got to graze elsewhere, there's no grass left. Bring them back. So looking forward. This ancient place accommodates one of Britain's largest and most perplexing early monuments of its kind and is also home to the city's most exciting and diverse community of plants and bugs. Despite these features, Whitehawk Hill has remained largely anonymous, overlooked, perhaps just misunderstood, until now. And that's a lovely feeling. Exciting times lie ahead. I'd love to see a larger excavation project. <laughs> that darn given. Rainforest, yeah, that's the rainforest. The actual rainforest, rather than the rainforest in miniature. Um, I'd love to see 
a larger excavation project in the near future, this time within the monument and again involving the local community as there is a real appetite for this now. I'm not an archaeologist, although I can dig it. But I would anticipate, oh, but I would anticipate um, that involving unskilled volunteers in a community project inside the scheduled area will present more logistical uh, challenges than the Dig White Hawk project potentially did. But uh, which was focused outside the perimeter of the, the monument. However, together I'm sure we can come up with ways to engage with local people and still include them in the works. The three factors that drive the way we manage the hill are wildlife, landscape, and most of all, people. Um, and as a result of my involvement with this project and the people therein, I no longer feel like I'm just working for those on the hill today and for tomorrow, but also in honour of those that trod this ground long ago. Um, I've just mentioned the Living Coast you don't mind, John. Um, the Living Coast is a UNESCO World Biosphere Region, part of a global network of international demonstration areas for sustainability uh, that connects communities who are pioneering a positive future. So Brighton and, Hove, uh, Brighton and Lewis Downs Biosphere um, um, Zone is one of the, the world's designated biosphere zones, which is um, an amazing achievement. That was designated, I think, in 2013, 14, around the same time as the Dig White Hawk project. And again, puts Brighton, the area, Brighton area on the map and all the features and um, components that, um, that we have in the city. And we work with local archaeologists, including uh, Archaeology Southeast, as a means to engage people to appreciate and look after our world-class environment. And our mission is to connect people and nature across the downs, towns and coast. Thank you, everyone.